Gnomes and mermaids emerge when the earth is covered in humid vapors. Guard carefully the secrets of your precious wool and generally confuse the hell out of ancient philosophers. Because it's time to talk tall to me? Were you the ancient philosopher? Were you? I was someone confused. At least, no. we'll say that much. <laughs> Welcome back, friends, to our wonderful podcast. I am Omen Said, And I am Nick McGill. Together, we are Feckless Moans. And this is Talk Tell to Me. An exploration of the fantastical properties of the mythological prog rock band Jethro Tull. Album by album, song by song... Nicodernus the Elder and Pope Omen the Third will discover and document such amazing creatures as the John Evan, a beast with the hands of a man and the body of a baby grand, the Dee Palmer, who can drive sailors to madness with her seductive strings, the Martin Barr, who can only be caught by a virgin and will grant you three wishes, provided that all the wishes are to hear a sick guitar riff. <laughs> And most mysterious of all, the Andersonia Ieni, which if caught under a full moon, the juice of which rubbed upon your skin will make you impervious to the cruel jabs and jibes of Rolling Stone magazine. Wow, that was good. Thanks, Nick. That was good. I like it. I continue to be impressed. I continue to aim to impress. Well, it is a symbiotic relationship and we both... <laughs> We both we both get out of it what we get out of it. So Nick, guess what? <laughs> Omen. Um, you guessed it. Yeah, it's Tuesday. It's Tuesday, and it's time for another episode of Talk Tall to Me. That's it. That's correct. We are actually recording on a Tuesday, so it's extra extra meta, multi layered. Double tall, here. double Tuesday. Yeah, that's right. And Nick, we have a, a fantastic and unique song to talk about. That we do. But first, we have some exciting business to cover. Correct. And before we get to that, it's been a little while. I think mm -hmm. we should play a quick round of What, what Are You, you drinking? drinking? Nick, what are you drinking? I am drinking a Wegmans breakfast blend. Ooh, That's of all. coffee, I of, of heroin. Of coffee, <laughs> yep. Yep, and out of one of my favorite mugs and a little, little, little dash of honey, a little splash of half and half. Nice. It is lovely. Sounds restorative. Yeah, it is. We inherited Ray's mother's percolator coffee maker. That it's it's this it looks like a camp setup, but it's I mean you just plug it into the wall and it percolates up and over. It's basically like a drip kind of, but it's for some it's reason it just drip. makes it makes better coffee. It's a flip. It's a flip. Flip Fl drip. Flip coffee maker, and it just makes Great. better coffee. I love I love the coffee out of it. Omen. Nice. Yeah. What are you drinking? Hey Nick. Uh, so I am drinking um, the reheated. 5.30 a.m. coffee that I made for my wife, which mm -hmm. is a Joffrey's holiday blend. If you're not familiar, Joffrey's is a coffee roaster in Tampa, Florida, which makes all of the coffee for the Disney parks in Florida. Mm. And it's quite good. It's got a little milk and that stuff that comes out of the trees, maple syrup in it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I've got it in my 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea mug, and it's quite good. That must have been a really tasty contract to land. Tastier than the coffee. Tastier than their coffee. Joffrey's, they're, they're in their their garage saying, we just landed the Disney contract. Come for the coffee, stay for the multi-million, multi-year deal. So what's the holiday blend? Is it got a little spice in there? A little, little clove, a little nutmeg, a little cinnamon? N no idea. I can't really taste it. Apparently it's got notes of blueberry or something. <laughs> Someone once told me. Yeah. It once, it once gazed longingly at a blueberry, but the blueberry didn't return its glance. No. No. So, Nick, Omen. do we have any other business before we dive into the, the meat? Is that it, just the meat? The meat. Okay. 
we will not be diving into the meat just yet. First, we have a pair of emails. Oh. oh. Marley. Oh. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Marley. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. I've left uh, several snakes in the kitchen. You've, you've left several of them? I left about a dozen, half a dozen or so. It, j- just like to roam free? They got out of the pan. The pan? Oh, you were cooking. You were cooking. The solstice snakes? Is that what Lunch it, will be ready in half an hour. Okay, great, great. I'll try to wrap up with Omen uh, as soon as possible. I appreciate it. Back into the fricassee dish, Ellen. I enjoy Marley's cuisine, I have to admit. Yeah. I do. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Marley. So we have the, a pair of emails here from two previous writer inners. <clears throat> Your emails, sir. First one, got Doc Savage writing in again. Thank hey. you, Doc Savage. Good morning. Another bloody email. But you do keep saying how much you and Omen enjoy them. <laughs> so it's it's our fault. Yeah. Outstanding as ever. Genuinely wish there were more hours in the day to cram more in. <laughs> On the last bonus track from Stand Up, which was 17, you were asking mm. about the word cake man. Do you remember cake oh, man? Oh, yeah. Yeah. My paternal grandmother from the North Midlands used to use this word. Really? It means a flashy type who likes to prey on teenage girls by offering them all sorts of goodies and promising them the world. Whoa! I remember being taken to visit my grandmother in the mid to late 70s, and she would forever be going on about the girl who lived two doors down and whom she said was, quote, putting out for the cake man. <laughs> End quote. Victim blaming was very much a 70s thing, although I have no idea whether that girl ate or even wanted any cake. As far as I can remember, I never saw her. My parents, quite buttoned up people, refused to explain what a cake man was, which only made it more intriguing. But one day, left in my grandmother's care, I use the noun advisedly, she told me exactly what it meant. I would have been about 11, so you can imagine how I was dying to meet this girl. But as I say, I never did. Mm. As a slang expression, I think it has long since died out, a bit like the song, perhaps. This piece is, is poignant. I'm trying to imagine what I would have to say about a song like Salamander, a place filler if ever there was one for me. Oh, doctor. (laughs) By the time I catch up to your time frame, you're probably going to be heartily sick of my communications. If brevity is the soul of wit, I'm about as funny as Joe Pesci in Goodfellas, aren't I? (laughs) Obscure reference. (laughs) No, I mean, it's, am I I funny to you? Am I a clown? That that scene, yeah. I'm funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you, I make you laugh, I'm here to f***ing amuse you. What do you mean funny? Funny how? How am I funny? But you can only blame yourselves. If you weren't so good and entertaining, I wouldn't bother. Do tell me to shut up, though. Merry Christmas, Doc Savage. What a wonderful blend (laughs) of information and (laughs) self-loathing. So thank you very much, Doc. Thank you, Doc Uh, Savage. I've got the lyric here from 17. Yeah. It's from the second kind of mini stanza. Mm -hmm. We were 17 and the cake man was affecting you moving you to greater things in a lesser way you had to prove. Wow, okay. Yeah, I like it. Great. I mean, I, for one, am certainly going to be reintroducing the term cake man into my vocabulary. Yep. Yep. Are you going to be the cake man or just commenting on other... That would be illegal and inappropriate. I agree. I just, I'm not sure how you you plan on doing it. Oh, I'm going to be like, uh, I'm going to, let's let's use cake man in a sentence. (laughs) Oh, I see you got a new Rolex. What are you trying to be? Some kind of a cake man, Jimmy? What? I, I don't know what accent that was. It wasn't an accent. It, it was my normal voice. No, I, uh, it was something. You better watch out, Jimmy, or your daughter's going to get baked into a cake by the cake man. 
That sounded like a th- a threat, though. That's like a that's a third rate Batman villain. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you like that one so much. I've got. <laughs> I just played an entire episode of Batman the Animated Series in my head yep. based on what you just said. Oh yeah, I can see wonderful. it. Wonderful. Yeah. So I've got one more super quick email. We've got okay. ourselves a jump start. Yay! From Johnny K. Johnny K, also previous writer in Earth, our friend from Australia. Yeah. He says he... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you going to roll this thing? I'll do it right now. Perfect. I don't need to put it in now. I discovered Tull in 1983, around age 17. Weirdly, my first album was Broadsword and the Beast. Mm. Soon after, it was Aqualung and Thick as a Brick. There was no turning back after that. I don't know if I would call that that weirdly or oddly. 1983, Broadsword. Broadsword was brand new. That's not weird at all for you to... Yeah, very current. ...to be introduced to Tull then, and... It's a darn good album to fall in love with. Fantastic. And then to jump back to the, the big classics, Aqualung and Thick as a Brick, makes sense to me. Yeah. I, I, I don't think you need to be ashamed of that at all, Johnny K. I, it sounds like it sounds like Broadsword and the Beast was the bait and Aqualung was the hook. That's it. Snagged it, s- boated it, pull, reeled it in. Yes, boated it. O- yes. Other fishing terms. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is it for emails. Thank God. Omen. I think you have a little a little info on this song we're about to talk about, don't you? Well, well, yes, I do, Nick. First of all, what song is that? Oh, my goodness. It is Salamander today, track three off of Too Old to Rock and Roll. Indeed, it is. Give me one second to get my book. So while, you, while you're pulling that up, a salamander is an amphibian of the order Eurodella which, as with many real creatures, has often been ascribed fantastic and often occult qualities by pre-modern authors like Pliny, Augustine, way, way back. Pliny! Your boy Pliny, I know. They were found in a lot of medieval bestiaries. The legendary salamander is often depicted as a typical salamander in, in like, little lizardy shape, but it, it has been ascribed with the affinity of fire and is... When you're thinking of elemental creatures, this is a fire elemental. Indeed. There were some legends that people would bring from the the Levant garments made of salamander wool, Mm -hmm. which would be impervious to fire. And, of course, they were actually made of asbestos. Fortunately, people didn't live long enough in those days to die of cancer. No, they they burned to death. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So I have here from the, sorry, it's just awkward to get the book into the booth. Get the booth into the book then. Oh, okay. Good idea. <laughs> I have from the book, A Passion Play, the story of Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull by Brian Rabby. A couple of wonderful quotes on Salamander. Ian Anderson says in this interview, I was just thinking about that song in bed the other night when I couldn't sleep. When I got back and I was a little jet-lagged, I was just thinking, what is there I've never played live on stage that would really be kind of a buzzy thing to play? And that song came to me. It employs one of those hybrid tunings. It's not really an open tuning, but it has a number of open strings which allows you to play things you can't play on a regular concert-y tuning. Hmm. As an acoustic guitar piece, it's one of the rare occasions when Martin and I actually sat down in a studio and played live together during the piece. And it just occurred to me that that might be the one we resurrect as a live piece. The only problem is you don't have a lot of time in concert to fiddle about tuning up because it isn't just a question of dropping the pitch of a couple of strings. If you do it on any guitar, you have to retune everything. You change the tension of the untouched strings by virtue of reducing the tension on the strings you are detuning. It's not a 10-second operation. You're looking at 30, 40 seconds to retune two guitars, and our band is not very well known for being able to cover each other's tunings. However, we will figure this one out. <laughs> and w- when was this written? How, how long ago was that? 
that was while that was while Martin was still touring with the band. So it was at least, gosh, ten years ago, right? Yeah, the book was published in two th- in two thousand thirteen. So it was at okay. least okay. pre two thousand thirteen. Sure. Okay. I do want to point out the obvious, Nick, here for a second, and, and who am I to disagree with, with Ian Anderson, but there is such a thing as two guitars, like more than one guitar that is already pre-tuned. Unheard of. I, 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 it's just crazy. It's crazy, I know. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, they swap out guitars all the time for a single song. Yeah, that's what guitar techs are for. <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe it's that's Ian's famous Scottish frugality coming through. It's a it's a little too new school for him, I think. Yeah, yeah. Martin Barr, on the other hand, says, "We've recorded that in Monte Carlo, and it's a very difficult piece of music. Ian suggested that we do it on tour, and I swear I spent two whole days learning it because it's an open tuning, and I didn't know which open tuning it was. <laughs> it's not a normal one. It took me hours to work it out." I tried one tuning and then figured I'd got it wrong. I retuned the guitar again three or four times before getting it right, and then I could learn it. I do remember it was a very good piece of music. It was the best thing we ever did together. But at that time, it was just another song. It was difficult to play and sounded great. Wow. High praise from both of them. So this is really, Nick, I mean, each, each Tull song is unique, like a snowflake or a... A sheep, but a sheep. or an orca whale, <laughs> or a, a Faberge egg, or a Faberge, a Faberge egg, lovingly handcrafted in Mother Russia, but F- Faberge orca. This is this this song is quite unique in that it appears to be the only song that was recorded through this process of Ian and Martin just sitting down together and and banging it out. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just two acoustics. I mean, there there is a little bit more in there, but... We'll get there, yeah. There's some other instruments, but primarily it is the two acoustic guitars that are being played in tight, tight formation. So that was the live part. That was the part that they played together. I'm, I'm, I can't imagine there was also a little orchestra in the back play, playing the strings as well. No, I don't think. But that being said, that is... Like you said, that is a a notable piece that they sat together and played this live. They played it together. Now, Nick, at the risk of milking the goat into not a bucket, let us actually have a listen to Salamander um, so that we can then talk about the, these musical <laughs> these musical things. We can. I, I'm, I'm caught up on the milking a goat into a bucket, but yeah. <laughs> Don't. Don't milk the goat before you've got the bucket set. Famous expression. Is it? And so, Nick, without further ado, let's have a listen to Salamander. Boy, that is the fastest three minutes I've ever experienced in my entire life. I, I genuinely love that song, Nick. I do now. I didn't, it was a lot like Doc Savage said, it felt a filler song. slightly filler, slightly out of place. I think that it does feel out of place just because it's so unique, but I think that whatever strange portal opened to allow this song to happen, if I had been there, I would have jammed a ballpoint pen into the door so that it wouldn't have closed completely, because I want more of that. Yeah, this song leaked over from from a mirror dimension, from like a neighboring dimension, and they got the crappy number three from that would have been on Too Old to Rock and Roll, and we got theirs. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, we gave up Hyper Sausage for it, though. <laughs> Man, you know what? I long for the days of Hyper Sausage. I, I, we'll never I, know. I tell you what, yeah. It's a mystery, and sometimes mysteries are best left as that. Sausage is a mystery, which is definitely best left alone. <laughs> well, let's talk about the music a little bit. Sure. As we've we've already talked about, that it's these two kind of dueling guitars. And as you pointed out, right off the bat, there is a little bit of D yep. magic. Yep, we get some very light strings here. We also get flute right off the start as well. Which then fades out and comes back rather spectacularly toward the second half of the song. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
at about two minutes, that last minute, we get into the bass and some tambourine. Oh, yes. Yep. Little tambourine. And that's Absolutely. really it. That's it for, for instrumentation. And it feels while those two acoustics are, are noodling back and forth, there's also bits and pieces of like the acoustic stepping out and going bing badoom, like pulling forward a little bit with a with a little flare here and there, a little flourish. It's a very interesting construction. So there's you have both of the guitars laying down this very intricate strumming pattern, which is so well synced up that I used to think, and I'm sure a casual list, listener might be forgiven for thinking that this is one guitar. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Being played by a person who had 10 hands with six fingers on each. Or or just Martin. Or, yeah, yeah, or Martin Barr. Yeah. <laughs> it is, in fact, these two guitars very well synced up, and they do, as you said, I think maybe trade off the... The melody bits, the the runs, the sort of doom, 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 doom. yeah. There's some lovely note bending that goes on. Yeah. Have we talked about guitar string note bending before, Nick? I'm sure we have. I'm sure that we have. If you want to, shall do we a, talk about it again? I'm sure if you want to do a refresher, we can. <laughs> so note bending, as I'm sure most of our listeners are fully aware, is on a guitar when you. You depress a string. By talking about your mother. That's right. You pluck that string, and then you move the string laterally across the neck with your finger, which stretches the string, increasing the tension, and thereby raising the tone. And that's how you get that kind of... There's an example of it. I'm sure you can drop it in here, Nick, where it's like... Mm. Yeah. It's the part. <laughs> yeah. I'll put it in. <laughs> That is mechanically the that's the nitty gritty of that sound, that guitar sound. It's not just something that you can strum along and play. You have to do something beyond just forming the chords. Precisely. Yeah. What else do we want to say musically about this song? Like I said at the start, like it is three minutes long, but it is so fast. It is so fast. Yeah. We've seen this a handful of times before at this point. It, it starts strong. It starts fast right out of the gate and just carries you through before you know what happened. You know, there are a couple other sort of interesting points about this song to to note, and that is that it is the first song so far on this album that does not end with mm. a fade-out. Sure. Mm -hmm. It just ends with... Yeah. A double flute, no less, yeah. A, sounds like my college days. We all experimented. It's fine. No judgments here. <laughs> the crispness of those guitars is wonderfully juxtaposed with the reverb that Ian has put on his own singing voice, which gives it that dreamy quality in the in the verse that he sings. Okay. Didn't think about that. That's interesting. Because the guitar is, I mean, you can't, if you put any reverb on any of that, it would, it would get so muddy. Yes, you would lose a lot. You certainly would. But the other instruments, I think maybe the strings and definitely the voice have a, a little bit of echo or, or reverb, and so you get that salamander. Mm. salamander. <laughs> that was a that was a ride. <laughs> Do you like my my crooning, Nick? Oh, it's nice. It's nice. I felt a little a little tingle mm -hmm. all over the place. I won't even tell you where. Yeah, it's in my cupboard. <laughs> so, yeah, and I think that kind of, for me, that's it musically. Yeah, I think it, it covers it. It's a lot like Crazed Institution where there, it seems like there's a lot going on, but it's just because it's it's it has a cacophonous effect to it, and there's really not a lot. It's just stacked and built the right way to make it feel very meaty and in-depth. I agree. I would say that it is a it is a rich sound, mm. meaning that, you know, in a small quantity of sound, if we can say that, you have a lot transmitted. You have a lot of information. Right. There's a lot going on. But when you break it down into its individual pieces, it's it's really quite simplified. And that's what is so beautiful about really excellent musicianship is that excellent, excellent musicians can take 
what is on the face of it simple mm-hmm. and deliver something that is exquisite and elegant and unrepeatable and extremely difficult. Simple doesn't mean easy. Yes, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Nothing easy about a simple syrup. Nothing is easy. That's what nothing is easy was actually about is a, a simple syrup recipe. Oh, sugar, yeah. Yeah. Yep. The guitar playing on this song reminds me of a musical duo that I don't know if you're familiar with, Nick, but I think you would probably love called Rodrigo e y Gabriela. Yeah, I know him. You know him. Yeah, they're great. They're great. And they have that kind of same, you know, intensely dueling m- guitars which are perfectly timed out to produce this incredible effect. And it's it's just the two of them. They have a, a Spanish guitar sound. Fetish sound. But it it has that it has that kind of classical Spanish feel to it. And they're they're awesome. They're their own percussion. They're their own vocals. It's it's just the two playing guitar and it's they're they're wonderful. They are really wonderful. Yeah, according to rodgab.com, Rodrigo A. Gabriela are a Mexican acoustic guitar duo whose music is influenced by a number of genres, including nuevo flamenco, rock, and heavy metal. Perfect. A lot of times people will say that they are the Jethro Tull of, of nuevo flamenco. Very regular talking point in the in the rock circles. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So shall we get into these, these two stanzas, these tiny little two stanzas, Omen? Let's oil ourselves up and squeeze into them, Nick. <laughs> Boy, I haven't worn this since college. It's been a little weight. <laughs> Amazing that it still fits as well as it does. (laughs) Salamander, born in the sun-kissed flame, who was it lit your candle, branded you with your name? Born in the sun-kissed flame, who was it lit your candle, branded you with your name? Lot to dissect there. Let's start at the end. I looked up the etymology of the word salamander. Okay. It comes from Old French. Cool. Salamandre. <laughs> That's just a funny way to say salamander. Which in turn comes from ancient Greek, salamandra. Okay. So in terms of Ian's question, who branded you with that name? It was the ancient Greeks. The Greeks, yeah. yeah. And, and fascinatingly, it's a name which is, it's a word which is, changed almost not at all yeah in the 3000 years that it's been around 2000 years that it's been around and what does it what does it translate to salamander it is what it is it is what it is there's no, there are no disparate pieces that mean certain things it is nope. it is a, a name for the animal and that's all it's been that's cool it has occasionally in more modern times been used been applied to other things such as right Kiln ovens and... The cooking implement in a commercial kitchen that is basically just a heavy-duty broiler. They call it a salamander because you drop it under and it it broils and cooks the top portion very quickly. You'll throw a French onion soup under there to melt the cheese in 15 seconds. Yeah, that's nice. (laughs) Nice melty cheese on my French onion soup. I want to pull some quotes from ancient history. (laughs) Of course you do. Pliny the Elder, your friend and mine, describes the salamander as an animal like a lizard in shape and with a body speckled all over. It never comes out except during heavy showers and goes away the moment the weather becomes clear. Now that, you might think, is a pretty... Fairly accurate, non-mythological. Yeah. Pliny got that much right. He also goes on (laughs) to say... It eats whole cows and spreads fire across the land. Pretty much, yeah. That it's so poisonous that a single salamander, by twining around a tree, could poison all the fruit and kill any who drank water from a well into which the salamander had fallen. Yeah, I wonder where that came from. Cousin of a cousin. Well, they are. They do have a certain level of toxicity. Right. But the... Is it just writing for excitement at that point? <laughs> like, it's, it's classic Pliny the Elder exaggerating everything. Yeah, yeah. He was known for his hyperbole. He really was. One theory that I'm seeing proposed is that the association with fire and the salamander came because the many species of salamander hibernate in, in rotting logs and, you know, between the bark and wood of a log. And so if you brought those logs in and put them in your fireplace and let them on fire— 
you mm. might see a salamander escaping. Sure. And in, you know, not having the benefits of modern science, you might suppose that it was spontaneously generated by the flame. Right, yeah. A lot like they thought that flies were just spontaneously created by corpses. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, okay. And and that Instagirls are spontaneously created by Starbucks. Yep, yeah, that happens. That happens. That is, that is true. Pliny was the first one to say that, and by golly, was he right. He, he got one thing correct. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci, also our good friend, wrote on the salamander, this has no digestive organs and gets no food but from the fire in which it constantly renews its scaly skin. The salamander, which renews its scaly skin in the fire for virtue. What? <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci, bro. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I'll, I'll take it, Leo. Thank you. So, so this first stanza... Oh, yes, getting back to the song. It's getting back to the song. So this first stanza is seemingly about the amphibia. And referencing some of the classic mythical concepts of this creature. Right. Born in the sun, kissed the flame. Yep. Who was it? Lit your candle, branded you with your name. Lit your candle meaning hmm. brought your, created your myth, maybe? Yeah, I like that interpretation. Also... You know, just another association with fire. Right, yes. But yeah, who who lit the flame of your of your flaminess? Who who if you're if a salamander is an ever burning flame, mm -hmm. who started it? What is the right. origin of fire itself? It's very elemental. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a bit chicken in the egg, I suppose. Yeah. A little salamander in the flame. Salamander in the flame. However, stanza two leads me to believe this is allegorical. I see you walking by my window in your Kensington haze. Salamander, burn for me, and I'll burn for you. I see you walking by my window in your Kensington haze. Salamander, burn. Salamander, burn. Salamander, burn. Kensington is an affluent district in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea in West uh, Central London. How close is that to the Mews? Oh, to Baker Street? To the Baker Street Mews, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Let me see. Do, do, do geography, geography of London. Do, 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 do. London is a very ancient city. Do, 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 do. Bodicea burned it down. Do, 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 do. The Romans built it back up. It is a, it's about an hour walk, it looks like. Okay, so not very close. No. You can pass through Kensington Gardens. That's nice. That's pretty. I have done, and it's lovely. Through Hyde Park, yeah. So what is the window? I see you walking by my window in your Kensington haze. Or, oh, oh is it? You got is it? Is it that because, okay, I'm going out on a limb here, Nick. Let's do it. Kensington Gardens is a big old open green space. Yeah. It will get foggy more readily than other parts of London due to the proliferation of grasses and natural spaces. Therefore, is a Kensington haze a fog as one might see in Kensington, which could be anywhere in London at all, for instance, at Baker Street? I mean, foggy London town is a relatively common phrase. Yes, although some of that refers to pollution, the pollution <laughs> from the Industrial Revolution. Right, yeah. Yeah, but... England is rainy. England is foggy, is hazy at times. Yeah, I've heard that. So I, I think my thought is it's either that, it's either climatological or mm -hmm. what's what's the meteorological. So okay. it's, it's either meteorological or, or the salamander is a woman walking by. Mm. And she's in her Kensington haze because she's out buying stuff along the Kensington shop. She's not looking in all of the windows. She's kind of in her own world. She's Kensingtoning. She's she's Kensingtonian. Mm. And she's walking by and he spots her. And he's saying He's saying to himself, I wish I was a cake man, Jimmy. <laughs> you talk about my daughter? He and he's saying to himself, but he's addressing 
this woman walking by, this yes. salamander, you burn for me, I'll burn for you. I've got the fire in me for you if you if you can return the favor. So this is a this is a song of desire, a song of the deep flame of desire which burns from afar at the sight of a beautiful creature. If it's if it's not about a literal salamander, that is how I'm interpreting it. Yeah. Could it not be both? Could it not be describing a this a romantic attraction for an actual salamander? I mean, I suppose it could. Ian was ahead of his time. And he's, he was an amphibophile. The hardest thing to believe about that, though, is him seeing a salamander walk by his window in, in Kensington. <laughs> Unless he's yeah. in the gardens, then he may see them because there's, there's little bodies of water there. Well, then what's the window doing? Exactly. Bring it along? Exactly. His porta, his porta window. <laughs> I carry this around with me to protect <laughs> me from the eyes of others. <laughs> oh, look, a salamander. He pulls up the shade. <laughs> shade not included. Getting hot in here. I better wind down the window. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's not the most clear song for me. No, no. I, I, I. For me, you know, it. I don't know that there's really a literal interpretation to be had here. I think no. it's more, more interpretive and more maybe. I'm thinking back to the song that we talked about a while ago. Was it Sausity? I forget, there was a song about, that we decided was about the muse, you know, uh, not Baker Street Muse, but, you know, uh, inspiration. How do you find inspiration? Mm. How do you lose it? Mm -hmm. It might be Saucity, yeah. And for me, I wonder if this is a little bit like, you know, is is the salamander his burning drive and passion? He don't know, he doesn't know where it came from. Oh, okay. He finds inspiration in, in his town of London. Mm-hmm. The world burns for him, and so he has to burn by singing about it. I wonder if, you know, there's something more deeply metaphorical here. I, I mean, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there absolutely is. However, I do want to bring us back to the world that is too old to rock and roll. I was just thinking about that. This is presumably because it's on this album. This is part of the stage show. Somewhere. Well, you know what happens when you presume, Nick? You make a prune out of you and me. <laughs> so, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so sorry. I think I think that this could be part of the stage show, and we could uh -huh. we could talk about that, and and we will. But I also think that it could just be a random piece. That's also possible. That made it onto the album. Yep, it's also possible. Sure. And it could even be that the music existed, and then Ian was like, "Oh, maybe I should put some lyrics to it." Here's a random stanza I found after drinking a bad bottle of grappa. Yeah, he woke up in a haze and found it, and he's like, this will fit in here. In a Kensington haze. The classic Kensington haze. Hmm. Is this an introduction of a love interest further down the line in the story? It could be. It's early enough in the play that it could be. It reminds me, if, if it were going to be that, it reminds me a little bit of the description which D'Artagnan gives of Milady in The Three Musketeers. He's inexorably drawn and frightened of her, drawn toward and frightened of her. And she was branded on the shoulder with a fleur-de-lis, which is sort of a fire thing. There you go. Okay. That's it. Solved yeah. it. Tune into our other podcast, Discuss Dumas, to me, where we will just fangirl over the works of French writer Alexander Dumas. So it's going to be one of those solo podcasts, huh? Yep. <laughs> I just need you to listen. Yep. I'll be here. So, Nick, yeah. Anything else about Salamander? I don't think so. I think I've said my piece. I, I've thrown in my ideas and how it'll fit in. And, and really, it's musically, it's simple. Lyrically, it's less simple, particularly because Quiz Kid and Crazed Institution were felt so right to the point. Mm. And they were some of the least veiled songs, the least Kensington hazy songs. Yeah, they followed a clear narrative. That now this is a bit of a kind of a shock to the system to get back into what we're accustomed to with Ian. That being said, I, I, I mean, I like the song a lot. I think we should conclude the discussion of this song with a excerpt from a letter from the 12th century writer Prester John, who says, our realm yields the worm known as the salamander. 
Salamanders live in fire and make cocoons, which our court ladies spin and use to weave cloths and garments. To wash and clean these fabrics, they throw them into the flames. When he says a worm, is it W-Y-R-M? No, no, the regular conventional spelling of worm. Oh, okay. Because W-Y-R-M is like the spelling for a dragon. A dragon is a worm. Right. I think he was talking about silkworms. Oh, that makes sense too. Yeah, throwing your silk hand-woven garments into the fire to clean them. Not a good idea. Not recommended unless you have an extraordinarily expendable clothing budget. Yeah, right. If you if your silk budget, you got to spend it or you lose it, by all means, yeah, go for it. Throw it in the fire. <laughs> if, if, if the government has a silk budget, that makes sense. I get it. <laughs> so, Nick. Omen. What do we have the pleasure of talking to all about next week? Next week, it feels like we're going to be getting back a little more logically into the story. It is the fourth track off of side A from Too Old to Rock and Roll. It is Taxi Grab. Love it. Love that song. Do you really? I am very, very excited about that one. And looking at the, the list coming up, I am looking forward to to a lot of them. Until next week, there is... A mysterious fabric which can protect us from the flames of obscurity. It is harvested from the sky salamanders known as stars. Weave us a review made of five of those stars and we will wrap ourselves in it to protect ourselves. Until next week, I am Nick McGill. I am Omen Said. We are Feckless Momes. And this is Talk Tall to Me. Master Caxton, would you please, please expound upon that creature, that mystery known as the salamander? Gather close. My years of waning come to an end. I must pass on the secrets. You see, Pope Alexander III had a tunic which he valued highly. This salamandra beareth wool, of which is made a cloth and girdles that may not be be burn in fire. Ooh. I have several times put salamander hair in the fire and made it red hot. Ooh. And after taking it out, which being cold, yet remained perfect wool. My. My, my son, gather closely more. I have one more secret to give ye. Do, do tell, do tell. Uh, from the Emperor of India. I once have heard him say that Doc me is a proud member of the Feckless Bob's Audio Network. Your words have not fallen on deaf ears, father. <laughs>